Hello, welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm Claire Rusbridge. I'm a veterinary neurologist and today we're going to talk about canine Chiari malformation and why it is more than just a cerebellar herniation. I'm particularly passionate about this disease. I've been researching it for over 25 years after I described the first case in a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel way back in 1995. So what is canine Chiari malformation? And why do I say that it's more than just a cerebellar herniation? Well, the human version of this disease was described by Hans Chiari, and that's where we get the eponymous name from. And he did, in humans, first describe herniation of the cerebellum. And that is to say, um, the hindbrain, the back part of the brain, was coming out the back part of the skull. And this included uh, the back of the uh, cerebellum. However, in the dog, it is much better to think of this as a whole brain disease um, because it does involve the entire skull and also the junction between the brain and the spinal cord, the so-called cranial cervical junction we can hear, see here. And uh, really, if you just think of the cerebellar herniation, which is this little bit here, this is the, the, the cerebellum here, and this is the bit of the cerebellum that is coming out the back of the skull, the, the back of the skull is right here. If you just think about it as that, you're really not seeing or understanding the whole disease. And in fact, the whole disease is all of these different abnormalities here. So it's very complex. The disease in humans actually that it's most similar to is not uh, Chiari malformation type 1, but Chiari malformation associated with craniosynostosis. And that is when you get premature closure or early closure of the joints between um, uh, the bones of the skull. And in the dog, one of the most important joints are, are these ones here and here, which are on the skull base. Uh, and what these dogs have is brachycephaly, that is to say shortened cranium. This is the bit of the cranium here, which is the bit that the brain is in. They have a shortened cranium um, and they don't have adequate compensation um, in the rest of the skull. So overall, the brain is in a much smaller space. And this results in all of these different abnormalities here, which you can you can see represented in the yellow and the and, and the red. So first of all, there's, there's an inadequate space at the front of the brain. And so the brain is pushed back. So you tend to get a flattening of the frontal lobe. You get reduction of the olfactory bulbs, the bits of the brain that are associated with um, with uh, smelling or olfaction. The brain gets pushed back, pushed back as demonstrated by these um, uh, red arrows. Um, and this results in less space for the back of the brain, the hind brain. So yeah, uh, we have less space in the, um, uh, in the compartment for the cerebellum and the brain stem, especially as this bone here is also compromised. It's much straighter and flatter than normal. So the hind get brain gets pushed um, into the cranial cervical junction. We get some kinking um, of um, the brainstem area here and um, and the whole effect is that the, there is much brain overcrowding within the skull. This can lead to secondary effects uh, including syringomyelia which is a fluid cavitation of the spinal cord which is the subject of a, another video. So the, one of the problems that we have with this disease is that the breeds that are predisposed to Chiari malformation tend to have it to some degree uh, in, uh, in most of the breed or even all of the breed. So when we take the Cavalier King Charles Spaniel, which is a breed that is particularly predisposed, we can see some mild overcrowding at the back of the skull. Um, uh, but when we compare this to a dog with severe disease, we can see that this cerebellum here is, is moderately round, whereas this one really looks like it's been squeezed from the back and squeezed from the front. Um, we can see the difference between going from the brain stem to the spinal cord here. Can you see how there's really quite a pronounced kink? 
And this is the syringomyelia that we're going to discuss uh, in another video. You might be saying to me, oh, well, this brain overall just doesn't look as uh, well defined as this one here. And you'd be right. And that's because you can't see all the little folds and indentations of the brain, the sulci and the gyra, sulci being flu flu full of fluid, um, uh, cerebral spinal fluid. Um, and these have all been flattened. And I should have said um, earlier that this is an MRI scan of uh, a dog's head and the nose is towards this end and the neck is here. And it's as if we've taken the brain and done a slice right down the middle. So we're looking at the front part of the brain and then the back part of the brain and then the spinal, um, spinal cord. So we see flattening of the gyra here because it, there, there isn't any space um, for those that folding or the cerebral spinal fluid. And we can also see that there's uh, some moderate dilatation of all the ventricular system. So this is the lateral ventricle here. This is the third ventricle here. And this is the fourth ventricle here. And the outflow of the ventricular system is just to the side here through the lateral apertures, and it's likely that these are obstructed, and that's why you get that di dilatation um, of that ventricular system. And the whole disease can be described as a cerebral spinal fluid disorder, because the cerebral spinal fluid uh, movement uh, out of the brain uh, and into the surrounding space around the brain is being uh, impacted. So canine chiari malformation is uh, better thought of as a complex craniosynostosis. Uh, that is to say premature closure of the uh, growth plates, which are the joints between all the various skull bones. And it's associated with extreme brachycephaly. Now I have to explain that word because many people think brachycephaly is associated with being flat faced. And it is, many brachycephalic dogs are flat faced, but brachycephaly is actually having a shortened cranium, this bit here, the bit that houses the brain. Um, and so you can be brachycephalic and still have a reasonable length muzzle, although it, it is more common that brachycephalic dogs are also flat faced because humans have selected for dogs that have both the rounding of the dull, uh, uh, sorry, the rounding of the skull, which is uh, a, a, a constant feature with brachycephaly because the skull compensates by uh, the shortness here by making more height here. Um, humans tend to select for this rounding of the skull and also for the flattening of the face because these features are more similar to babies. Um, and so, Canine Chiari malformation is associated with, with brachycephaly, that is to say, having a much shorter skull. And that can be calculated by the cephalic index, which is the breadth divided by the length times uh, the uh, 100. Um, and most brachycephalic brains also have this shortened muzzle, the foreshortening of the facial skeleton. And they often have aerorynchy, which is tipping back of the nose, which we can see here often they'll have um, their lower jaw shorter than their upper jaw. So when we look at the breed that is most predisposed to canine Chiari malformation, which is the, the um, Cavalier King Charles Spaniel, we can see quite a difference in the skull shape between dogs that are normal and dogs that have pain associated with Chiari malformation and dogs that have the most extreme of the disease, which is having syringomyelia. And uh, as I've intimated before, this may be because humans are selecting for dogs which have this predisposed skull type. This is a normal dog. Um, she uh, lived to about 15 years of age and didn't have any problems associated with canine Chiari malformation. In fact, we saw her um, uh, uh, MRI scan earlier and we can see this is a very cute looking dog. She's, she's um, a, a very beautiful animal um, and she has a much longer nose and a much longer skull. However, when we look at the dog that is affected by uh, canine Chiari malformation and also this dog has syringomyelia, 
you can see that we have quite a different looking dog. She has a much more rounded skull. She's much shorter. Um, all her facial features are really clustered together um, uh, so that she has eye, nose directly below eye, um, and she has a much shorter muzzle. Now, some people would argue this is a much cuter, more adorable, prettier looking dog, but that beauty in inverted commas, commas comes at a price. And now we're going to see a video which shows how the brain changes when we go from the MRI scan, scan of the normal dog, which we call CMN, to a dog with a Chiari malformation, which is now, um, and uh, a dog with syringomyelia. And we can really see how the brain is being squashed because it's the same size brain. Just because the dog's head is smaller doesn't mean their brain is necessarily smaller. And I think you can appreciate here just how much squashing there is. There's also changes in the other parts of the skull. So going through it again, we can see normal here. We can see the brain being pushed back and everything being pushed back. There's the cerebellum and the hindbrain being pushed and kinked. Uh, against the outlet um, uh, into the spinal cord. We can also see changes in the soft palate. We can see changes in the airway, which becomes narrower. And it's no coincidence that a lot of dogs that have this problem also snore. And snoring is not normal in a dog. It is a reflection of having an obstructed airway, even if they don't have the full blown BOAS or brachycephalic uh, uh, obstructed airway syndrome. And this uh, uh, video is to show another example. This is a, a chihuahua. So canine Chiari malformation is associated with brachycephalic small breed dogs like the Cavalier King Charles Spaniel, the Chihuahua, the Maltese, um, and uh, the Affen Pincher and Griffon Broussois, to name uh, but, a, but a few. Uh, and this is a uh, normal uh, chihuahua. And I'd like to point out just a few features here. This is this is a, um, a made from the CT scan as if we've again directly sliced down the middle of the skull here. So we've got a complete slice right down the middle um, uh, of the skull. And then these are the vertebrae of the neck. And I'd like to point out some some features here. First of all, this green uh, arrow here. Um, and then we have this angle here, this angle here, and then the soft palate here. Now look how it changes when we go to a dog, a chihuahua with a Chiari malformation. So you can see that this is not just something where the brain is, um, uh, is having uh, some overcrowding, but a condition where um, we have quite a change in angulations as well, which all affect the compliance of the system. That is its ability to absorb pressure. And we can see in particular that this angle becomes more of a right angle. So we get a more well-defined stop. And the stop is the junction between the muzzle and the, uh, and the, uh, and the skull bones of the, of the forebrain. We get the soft palate lifting up. We get this um, a height of the cranial cavity increasing. And this is because this is short. And so to accommodate the brain, it has to make some adjustment. We see that this bone gets much flatter. And actually in this dog gets never forms properly in the first place, something we call occipital dysplasia. And importantly, we get this angulation at the cranial cervical junction between the skull bone and the uh, first cervical vertebrae, which all affects the compliance of the system and also the um, uh, cerebral spinal fluid flow. So just once more. So I hope that's giving you an overview of canine Chiari malformation. Um, just in a nutshell, in other recordings uh, that will be appearing, we'll discuss the clinical signs of canine Chiari malformation, how to diagnose it, the pathogenesis of syringomyelia, 
and the treatment and management of syringomyelia and then we'll go into breeding advice. Thank you very much uh, for listening to this video and if you liked it um, then please subscribe and click on the like button.